Which brings us to a segment we like to call Ba with the Ba. Da bang, da dang. Diggy, diggy. Diggy, said the boogie. Said up jump, the boogie. My name is Kid. Kid Rock. The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It's episode 298. It is uh, April of 2022, some day time in April. I'm Ethan. I'm Liam. Liam, so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many things we can't talk about. Right here on the first and still the only, somehow, still the only wrestling podcast. That's right. So WrestleMania happened this past weekend and all the accoutrement to go with it. A Tony Khan Ring of Honor show, a Tony Khan press conference, uh, a lot of GCW events at the Collective, Joey Janela's Spring Break Parts 1 and 2, For the Culture, Planet Death, just 4 million shows. Uh, Friday, Saturday, Thursday, Friday, very busy days. WWE Hall of Fame with Undertaker's TED Talk. <laughs> And then the uh, NXT TakeOver on Saturday afternoon, and then finally the two nights of WrestleMania, Saturday, Sunday. What did you see? What did you like about uh, many weekend shows that were not WWE? Yeah, so I watched uh, night one of Joey Janela's Spring Break show. It was uh, not a great show. <laughs> um it it you know there was some fun stuff on it. Ali Catch and Mickey James had a had a match, and uh, and then there was a a pretty fun. I did I did enjoy Joey Janela versus X Pac for what it's worth. It was not a a classic, and uh, X Pac was working with a torn bicep as it turned out. And um, but I thought they still put in the effort and and still had a pretty darn good match. Uh, uh, and then I, I thought uh, I didn't I didn't think much of Moxley's match, but uh, I thought the main event, which was um, which is Alex Cologne and John Wayne Murdoch in a death match for the whatever they call their hardcore title, the ultraviolent that, title. That's right. Um, thought that was really good uh, up until I thought the finish was very odd, and I couldn't I didn't hear anything about Alex Cologne being like actually hurt. But the the finish, which I guess maybe was also playing off uh, maybe a real injury he had had in February or something, but they did a spot where he went to clothesline uh, Murdoch and he hit the hit the corner post and started selling like it was his arm was broken or something, and then like a minute later Murdoch just put him in an arm breaker and submitted him. So it was kind of a flat ending, but uh, you know it was a GCW show, which you know it had some high highs and. And uh, some some also some stuff that I didn't think was as good, but it was uh, it was certainly memorable. It had a good atmosphere to it. And then, yeah, Friday I watched the the Ring of Honor Supercard of Honor show, um, which was also I thought I thought top to bottom was a pretty strong show as far as the wrestling. Uh, I didn't think Willa Nightingale and Mercedes Martinez were was was very good, but the the rest of the card I thought was was pretty solid. I think the standout match, obviously, maybe you could argue of the entire weekend, was the FTR Briscoes match. Um, that was fantastic, as uh, as the number one FTR hater on uh, on the planet. I I will begrudgingly say that they had two very good matches this week. Um, and uh, yeah, I thought I thought that was really good. The main event, I I've seen both Bandito and John Gresham have good matches, but I did not think they had a good match with each other. Um, so I thought the main event was a little flat. But then the main event almost was kind of just the precursor to what everyone was really talking about when the show was over, which is that Samoa Joe showed up. Yeah, definitely. Uh... I don't know that it's super unexpected that he ended up there, but maybe the time and place was um, unexpected. Yeah, I think uh, I think we we touched on it briefly last week, as as we have perhaps discussed a bit in the past. Tony Khan has a has a fondness for announcements and for teasing a, teasing a big surprise, and he had mentioned in one of his various interviews that he does busted open or one of those shows that. 
Uh, he said he had heard some fans or seen some fans tweeting about leaving the Ring of Honor show a little early to make some other show. And then he said, oh, that's that's not I wouldn't do that because there's going to be a really big deal at the end of the show that you're going to want to be there for. And I was like, well, at that point, it's like, what could be a really big deal? And I was like, to me, it had to be either like Danielson or or a new person. And it's like, who would be a new person that would debut at a Ring of Honor show that would make sense and would be seen as a big deal to fans of ROH and Ring of Honor? And at that point, I was like, yeah, OK, Joe. Joe seem Joe would be on that list um, at the very least, but yeah, I mean it's he's uh, he's back and he's wrestling and they're shooting angles and they shot an angle on Ring of Honor at the end of the show with Jay Lethal turning heel and and Joe showing up to run him and Sanjay Dutt off and then they uh, they continued that story on Dynamite this week, but we can get to that in a moment. So we have to watch Ring of Honor now, and we have to watch Dynamite now. And oh boy! <laughs> Look, at the very least, on Dynamite they did show recaps, so they didn't expect the nine hundred some thousand people having uh, 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 that watch Dynamite every week to have seen this ROH show. But yeah, it looks like they will be. In addition to the Dynamites and Rampages, the ROH shows will also have angles that lead into things on AEW television going forward. Thrilled. <laughs> I'm thrilled that I get to watch not one but two Tony Khan book promotions. Mm-hmm. It's wonderful. All right. So then, uh, Friday night uh, Hall of Fame. I still not have seen the Hall of Fame because I had to be. I forget what I had to watch. Rampage, I think. Mm. <laughs> I think I had to watch Rampage during the Hall of Fame. Apparently, the Undertaker gave a TED talk and <laughs> is auditioning to be a televangelist or something. Yeah, I uh, I watched most of the Hall of Fame. I kind of uh, skimmed Undertaker's like because he talked for like fifty minutes, <laughs> and I don't think he's an interesting enough guy to uh, to talk for that long. So I did. Uh, he, you know, there's some nice stories he told. Uh, you know, he shouted out to Shawn Michaels and and mentioned you know talk told a story which I hadn't heard. He may have told it on the the one of the documentaries last year, but about you know they were told they were going on third at WrestleMania 25 and they, they had 15 minutes. And then they, without saying this, he said he basically, they, they pitched a fit and got put on later in the show and got more time. And that once they were done, they had a, uh, you know, everybody that had to follow them, wished they had gone on last and all that stuff. So it's like, there's some nice moments in there as far as him shouting out triple H and Sean and, and, uh, and Kane and whoever else didn't mention Foley, which I thought was, interesting considering you know that guy kind of that middle part of the of undertaker's career where he wasn't having good matches and wasn't a hot character uh mick foley pretty big part of <laughs> of helping him through that era and did not get a mention but uh well the the the, the wwe narrative is that undertaker made foley not vice versa mm-hmm. <laughs> I guess so, but yeah, he uh, he did not. Um, so I, again, so he he talked for a long time. It seemed like a nice enough speech, you know. He got real emotional talking to his talking about his children and stuff like that. So it was, you know, if if you didn't know what a what type of person he was, uh, you probably you could probably really enjoy the speech. Um, uh, I think the highlight of the Hall of Fame for me was probably the the Shad Gaspar uh, getting the getting the Warrior Award um, minus the giant warrior statue and, and Dana warrior being out there. Um, sure. Sure. Um, but you know, JTG brought Shad's wife and son out and then DHD and Shad's son did the crime time, like handshake. It was very, very sweet. And then uh, Shad's wife gave a very, very nice speech. Um, and I thought Charmel's speech was fantastic too. Um, the, everybody except undertaker got like four minutes. So nobody really got to tell, a lot of stories or, or really have a, a great speech. It's, it's really still not the hall of fame of old, even though they are doing it live, they're still seemingly keeping pretty much everybody except maybe the main adventures on a, on a pretty short leash. So, but you know, it wasn't, like I said, from what I saw, it was still an enjoyable show. It wasn't quite the, uh, the, 
the 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 bummer that it was last year. But yeah, you, I'm sure everybody, uh, I'm sure a lot of the inductees, especially maybe Rick and Scott Steiner, wished they got more than five minutes for for them to talk. But yes, it was a, it was an enjoyable enough show from what I saw. Saturday afternoon was not Takeover NXT, and they changed the women's tag titles and changed them back on NXT <laughs> television. They had the women's champion retain. They had Dolph Ziggler retain and then dropped the title back to Braun Breaker on Raw on Monday. Mm-hmm. And uh, I honestly don't remember who won the tag team. Uh, I do. MS- <laughs> oh, right, right, right. So, <laughs> so much stuff happens here. <laughs> yeah. So, so MSK won the tag titles. And then one of them got fired. Mm-hmm. When photos emerged first of his wife with apparent injuries that she alleged were from abuse. And then, but apparently that wasn't enough for, to get old Nash Carter fired Mm -hmm. (laughs) because there, there was really no, they put them on TV on Tuesday night. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) They put them on TV, cutting a promo on Tuesday night. And then, uh, there was a photo of, um, the young man doing a Hitler salute with a Hitler mustache. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine? <laughs> you know, and look, I think I don't want to. I'm not going to try to justify anything. If if you ask Whoa. me, <laughs> just to be clear, if you had if you asked me to analyze what that photo was, I would say. This was a guy who was trying to be edgy and funny. He could also be a real racist because to my knowledge, he hasn't commented on the photo or any of this publicly. Um, and maybe that's for the best because uh, I think his his lawyer is the same as Matt Riddle's uh, lawyer. He's so. taking right. He's taking legal advice from Matt Riddle's first lawyer. Yes. Yes. So maybe it's for the best that he hasn't said anything. But so even if you give him that benefit of the doubt and go, oh, he was trying to do like edge lord, 4chan humor, and you know, was shaving and just thought, oh hey, this looks funny. I'll take a picture. What what it's not funny. Like it, it, what's the joke? <laughs> you know, that would be my first thought. And my second thought is uh, if you're not a Nazi and you take a photo of yourself with a Hitler mustache doing the Nazi salute pretty big unforced error on your part i would have to say yes so uh yeah uh i don't uh you know he's welcome to defend himself either in a court or in the court of public opinion uh from all any and all of these allegations my understanding is that they're you know he and his wife are separated and i guess there were divorce papers that were filed in you know in whatever local court court system there but uh yeah as far as the other stuff goes uh yeah pretty pretty big unforced unforced error is the uh is the phrase that keeps popping into my head when i think about most of this if not all of it we shouldn't be shocked at really anything particularly when it comes to the cesspool that is florida wrestling Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and yet some the alleged photos of uh, a wife with physical abuse not enough to get you fired mm-hmm. but but have doing the 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 uh, nazi salute is the bridge too far so just if you're keeping track mm-hmm. of what is enough to get you fired you can beat up your wife you cannot do the hitler salute yes Yep, seems that way. Uh, it certainly would allegedly seem that way. And I guess we should have known based on, uh, I think, one one guy got fired after the speaking out stuff, and it was the one who admitted that he did it. So I yes. think generally speaking, if a WWE's internal investigations when it comes to allegations of abuse or sexual misconduct uh, seem 
seem to, from an outsider's perspective, of course, uh, seem to be, they go, hey, dude, did you do this? And that guy, if that guy goes, nope, then they're uh, they're pretty good with that, it seems. So, but uh, I guess the, the, yeah, it seems like the other photograph was the, uh, was the deciding factor in, in this guy getting released. So NXT TakeOver, NXT Stand Deliver, not TakeOver, was uh, not a great show. It wasn't a bad show either. It was just not really worth your time on a Saturday afternoon when there were like 900 more hours of wrestling to come that day. Mm -hmm. And then uh, WrestleMania Night 1 happened. And uh, boy, was that show a lot of fun. Uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was pretty. Uh, it was pretty darn fantastic. It was. It was, in fact, pretty stupendous. I have to say. Indeed, in indeed, uh, the unfortunate part was when uh, Rick, old Rick Boogs' uh, leg buckled in the opening match, and he tore his leg up apparently. And uh, they may or may not have changed to finish. I don't think the Usos were losing with titles, regardless. But uh, maybe the mechanics of how that finish went about uh changed but uh, rick boogs got hurt uh happy corbin was supposed to have a special entrance with a rolls royce the rolls royce wouldn't start um drew mcintyre beat happy corbin and then chopped the ropes with his sword i don't know what we're doing here <laughs> the miz and logan paul beat the mysterios and then the miz turned on logan paul because apparently it was in his deal that he was going to be a baby face. It's a, who, who could possibly care? And then, and then the show got really good, like halfway through it, with uh, Bianca Belair beating Becky Lynch for the Raw Women's title. Bianca's face got messed up. Uh, she's wearing sunglasses on Raw and posts a photo of. I, I know you were speculating that uh, maybe it was a broken orbital, orbital, mm-hmm. and certainly. If you've watched enough MMA and you've seen guys break their orbital bone and the weight swells up like that, it, it's possible. But I feel like maybe we would have heard. But anyway, she got a really bad black eye. But she and Becky Lynch had a really great match. One of the best matches of the weekend. Uh, without question. Mm-hmm. And they pulled the trigger. And Bianca Belair actually beat Becky Lynch. Yeah, I uh, I was we we had discussed that a bit last week that we were concerned that uh, we might uh, we might stall <laughs> we might stall out at uh, right at the finish line there, but uh, thankfully they they pulled the trigger because again, long term, if you want Becky Lynch to be your champion, there's ways to get the belt back onto her, but for the story they were telling, Bianca really had unless you're going to fire bianca <laughs> there's really no other solution in my mind than she had to win on that night with that story with the eight months of build up or whatever that they had they had uh put into this so yeah and they had a fantastic match uh you know becky i thought you know becky for me in the ring is not always a guaranteed home run she doesn't she doesn't strike out very often but she doesn't hit a lot of home runs either um for me so i thought but i thought she and bianca gelled really really well together and you know the match is all sort of built around becky just keeps cutting bianca off every time she gets on offense for the first half of it and you just really build up becky being this bully and just being angry and again pulling on bianca's ponytail at every opportunity and and then uh yeah it, it led to i think one of the coolest finishes i've ever seen which is where you know Bianca or, or Becky pulls her up for the the rock bottom, and Bianca somehow lands on the second turnbuckle, does a backflip, ducks the clothesline, and then hits the KOD and and pins her. Like it was the coolest thing. It was pulled off flawlessly, and yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing, and uh, and it was it was a great time, and the right person won, and it was a nice happy moment on this show. And Cody Rhodes came back and wrestled Seth freaking Rollins. And uh, Cody Rhodes came back with his AEW music, with his giant neck tattoo, with his <laughs> neck tattoo logo, 3D doing the weird 3D graphics thing mm-hmm. that WWE does all over the place. 
tell you what that the previous match and then uh, the wrestling has more than one royal family hitting uh just an absolutely bonkers half hour or so there <laughs> in uh in dallas <laughs> absolutely because again we talked about a million times about like we think he's coming in but like i think even now i didn't i didn't think they'd let him use that music i didn't you know i thought maybe he would get american nightmare he couldn't do anything about the neck tattoo i guess theoretically but no it was they did the same entrance with him rising up on the platform they did that yeah they left in they left in the word wrestling in his intro like there was this was absolutely uh you know a the aew cody rhodes character just transported into wwe and it was great and it's an example and again this happened a lot in the 1990s but it's been so long since we had like two you know viable wrestling promotions in the u.s you know running at the same time that like a guy who was maybe feeling a little stale and a little outdated in one place shows up in the other place and i mean obviously we've seen a lot of that the other way in wwe stars going to aew but here's an example of an AEW guy who felt like kind of a man without a country. And then he goes here and he's like instantly the number one baby face in the company, <laughs> at least on the men's side, like in, in, in one entrance, it felt like he was, he was the biggest star on the whole show. Charlotte beat Ronda Rousey in a match. <laughs> <laughs> no one could deny the bell rang at the beginning. There was professional wrestling. Then there was a finish and the bell rang again to signify that the match had ended. Yes, that's what happened. Uh, that's really all that happened. Uh, yeah. Ronda Rousey either was big mad or was not big mad. Don't print in the newspaper that she was mad. <laughs> that Steve Austin went on last on night one of WrestleMania. She was very not mad that she had to go on before Steve Austin. I took that to mean when they made the deal to bring her back, they told her, look, you're main event in WrestleMania and you're probably winning or you're winning. And then they broke, they broke those promises. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> nope. Nope. It's like, you could tell what they think of somebody though, by whether or not there's people that they, they would, that they would do that to. They would do that to Brett. They would do that to Ronda Rousey. Mm-hmm. They would not do that to Hulk Hogan, Steve Austin, John Cena, or The Rock. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's one hundred percent true. So that's that happened. It was a match clearly designed to build to a rematch, and Ronda and Brock are working WrestleMania Backlash. Still feels to me like at any given point, Ronda could just could just go home. <laughs> kind of makes the shows more exciting in that way um, because her yeah. promos don't, but the fact that just at any time we could be seeing her last appearance on the show, it's that, well, could be, at least that would be interesting. She does not seem to be, there's a, there is an, there's an element of her matches in her first run that is probably what, um, made it so that she doesn't have very many friends in the company it's like she was she did not train a whole bunch Mm -hmm. and was a real athlete at a very high level uh maybe not a real striker but she was a very good athlete she had you know olympic bronze medal medal or whatever it was in judo there was a an an unpredictability there was a violence to her matches (laughs) Mm-hmm. She, heard, she heard a lot of people. Yep. <laughs> she heard a lot of people. That's why her versus uh, Naya was so much fun. Yeah. Just wailing yep. on each other in there. Yep. There was a violence to her matches. And whatever it is in this run, that doesn't necessarily seem to be there. But also the matches just aren't. I don't think they're very good. Uh, it's like you're a few years older. You're a few years out of not really doing a whole lot of athletic things. And it's just, you're probably not, 
practicing a lot. It's mm-hmm. like uh, a lot of elements, but for whatever reason, this Ron Rousey thing just isn't clicking. Uh, I think number one reason is uh, <laughs> she should be a heel. Um, sure. Uh, yeah. And I mean, the alternative there, though, I, I think would be Charlotte would be a baby face, which is also no bueno. So maybe well, you should have, you should you could have just not booked the match. That's that's your other option there. The the only match that made sense is heel Ronda Rousey versus babyface Becky Lynch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and for whatever they were dead set on Becky being a, a heel, which mm-hmm. maybe was her call because she's like, look, if I'm coming back, I wanted to do something that challenges me, and so I wanted to do this. And like, and they were like, okay, well, we'll do whatever to get you back. So that makes sense, but. Rhonda does not want to be a baby face. She hates wrestling fans. She hates all fans. <laughs> and yet, yeah, and just, rightfully so to an extent. <laughs> oh, I mean, terrible people. <laughs> just, I, I think MMA fans are worse people and human beings than Probably. wrestling fans. <laughs> but still, uh, she was dead set on being a heel when she came back. And they're like, no, you have to be a baby face. Uh, and I, I, I don't know. I yeah, there's a lot of reasons it's, it's not clicking. But yeah, Charlotte, uh, Charlotte beat her, and uh, Charlotte is a heel, and Ronda's baby face. I don't know, man. I don't know. Steve Austin then made event at WrestleMania in what is supposed <laughs> to be his last match. So they did a match. Kevin Owens made event at WrestleMania against Stone Cold Steve Austin in a no holds barred match. What did you think of this? <laughs> uh overall um i my first thought was if i were running a wrestling company and i was gonna have stone cold steve austin wrestle on my show i would say that many times before the date of the show um i understand and i think you i think you maybe i'll I'll leave this to you i think you kind of had some insight onto why they did not but that was my first thought um my second thought is, as as far as the presentation as it went, um, I thought it was strange because all of the promos up until Kevin Owens' Go Home Show uh, promo were all about how they were going to fight each other. And then on the Go Home Show, Kevin's like, "No, we're just going to have a conversation." And then, and then, so at the show when Owens comes out and is just doing more shtick about how Texas sucks and. Then he brings Austin back out and he's trying to, you know, talk him down and not let him, for, you know, let him get so uh, upset at first. And, and I was like, oh, that's kind of strange. Uh, like why, why you switched notes there at the last second. And then in fact, they just said, well, we're going to have a match now. And they did it. Austin wrestled in a t-shirt and his jorts. He was too scared to show us his thighs. And <laughs> Uh, I mean, as far as what it was, I think it was like as close to a 1999 Steve Austin main event as Steve Austin was capable of giving us at this point. You know, you got your stops in the corner. You got your brawling on the outside of the ring. Steve did not take very many bumps until he took a suplex on the concrete um, and then gave a couple of suplexes on the stage. Um uh, did not do it. There was like one spot where Owens whipped him into the barricade and Steve had to run. Oof, oh. Would not recommend working that in. Uh, but yeah, I mean, overall, I think it it's delivered what people wanted to see, which was Steve Austin wrestle one last time. And, you know, he was in there with a guy who idolized him and who, you know, was was a good guy to be in there with. But it was just, it was a little, I thought the, the road to get there was very bizarre, but the, the result was enjoyable and memorable. It was three minutes of really solid action spread over 15 minutes. Fair, fair. Yes. Yeah. So I guess the, the logic was if you promise people a Steve Austin match and you had given them what they gave you, that maybe people would have been disappointed. And the narrative coming out of the show is Steve Austin is old and slow and can't go anymore and delivered a very underwhelming main event. But if you promise 
nothing, something, and give them what you what you gave them, nobody is upset. And that's a little bit galaxy brain for me, mm-hmm. but I at least understand it. So I think that's what they did. Yeah, I think that's that's a fair assessment. That's the assessment that made the most sense to me. Steve Austin coming back did not bother me the way Shawn Michaels coming back bothered me. And uh, there were two guys that stayed retired the longest. I think Michaels was like uh, uh, eight years or nine years or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And uh, Austin was 19 years. I was very upset when Sean came back um, because it felt like a money grab and it felt like he and <sighs> the thing he said for years was, look, I don't want to break my word to the undertaker. And then he mm-hmm. came back and did a tag match with the undertaker on a blood money show in Saudi Arabia. Mm-hmm. And like those four all made a pack. They're going to make a bunch of money together and blah, 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 blah. Austin coming back and doing one more match and then drinking beer with his brother in the middle of the ring in Dallas didn't bother me for whatever reason. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah, maybe the reason is uh, he didn't, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure he didn't do it for free, right? but uh, maybe, yeah, it feels like this was an event built around him done to try to have a big memorable final big steve austin moment i guess technically it's not the final one because then you had another one the next night but as far as a match goes yeah i mean it like i said i think you're right as far as like if you ranked it bell to bell with the sound down uh you know not great but the crowd wanted it to be special and and for what it was it was so you know i think it's one of those things where it just it was it was fun in the moment. If you try to go back and watch it in a couple of years, you might you might notice how little they're doing. And again, that to an extent, that's a, a testament to both of these guys right. that they that they got so much out of so little. But yeah, it was a it was it was a it was a happening. Yeah. As, uh, as Grill Monsoon might say. Yep. Night two, uh, raw tag title match opened the show, RK Bro retained the titles there's only three teams on raw whatever <laughs> <laughs> who could possibly care the very problematic gable steveson got in the ring after and they boy are they high on gable steveson yep gable steveson and matt riddle were toasting each other yep just, just no no commentary added just just pointing that out uh, no thing that happened bob lashley beat omas so doesn't seem like a good time to be Omas here. <laughs> yeah, once they've decided to let you do jobs as a giant, uh, you're going to be dancing in a few months here. <laughs> and uh, then, you know, depending on what they're paying you, you could be out of a job and they'll move on to the next giant in, in, in a year or two. They did give Omas MVP on Raw the next night and uh, Lashley turned baby face and um, and Omas is still a heel, I guess, with MVP as his mouthpiece, which like to me, the best part of the Omas thing is him standing there. And I don't think his promos are, were especially bad, but boy, this match with Bobby Lashley, horrendous. Yeah, it was not good. I could not believe that Bobby Lashley coming off of a shoulder injury took a pre- like a gorilla press throw <laughs> from a not particularly well-trained guy um, yeah. and landed directly on his shoulder on the fall. I was like, that's a brave thing for a 46 year old guy coming off of a shoulder, shoulder injury to do. But yeah, it was, it was not good. It was very much, it was very much a classic like 1985 beat like dug in and an earthquake or something. <laughs> yes. Like it's like it's like Bobby Lashley is very explosive. He's an incredible athlete, but he's also, you know, 46 and carrying around a lot of muscle mass. So he's not going to. And then also, like, what can he do with a guy that's that limited on the other side? Um, so it's right. probably probably an insult to John Tenta that I just compared almost because <laughs> uh, uh, he's significantly more limited than, than Earthquake was. But yeah, that's Doug, that was Duggan and Dino Bravo. Duggan <laughs> yeah, and Dino there you Bravo. Go. There you the go. Yeah. Yeah, Dino Bravo could not do a damn thing. <laughs> yeah, so it was just it was it was not very so it was either at best it was boring in spots and at worst it just it looked awful in other spots. So. Yeah. 
then business really picked up on this show with uh, Johnny Knoxville beating Sami Zayn in an anything goes match. Um, this is one of the most fun matches uh, in history. Yeah, like if you <laughs> if you were to say this is the best match of all time, I would not argue with you. It was incredible. It was like how often does I mean even on this show WWE involves celebrities and non full time wrestlers quite often on their shows, and yes. sometimes it's good, sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's awful. <laughs> Yes. But it's like somehow they had Johnny Knoxville <laughs> from Jackass, who was like 50 years old. Yes. And they and they they're like, you're gonna do a hardcore match, and it's gonna be not only is it going to be like a love letter to Jackass with like various props and 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 cameos from various crew members yes. over the years, it's also gonna be like a 2005 CZW match. <laughs> And Sami Zayn's going to take flip bumps to the floor through tables with mousetraps on them. And, and there's going to, and they're going to be like doing like trash can lid shots to the head and, and all of this crazy stuff. So it's like, it's like this garbage, like 2005 indie match mixed with like a very nice loving tribute to like what was, you know, whatever you think of, of Jackass as a product, like it's, it's a institution Sure. Of, of like of us you know american culture of the of the 2000s so like it somehow did all of that and then also just pulled off being a pretty good match like like as a wrestling match i watched this twice <laughs> like this was fantastic <laughs> on every level the the crowd being so into it really helped the crowd was really into all the jackass guys and all mm-hmm. the the cameos and stuff but you know they they probably will try to run this back one more time or something like at a SummerSlam, and it's like mm-hmm. really this should be it. <laughs> but yeah, there's no top in this. Like no, no, this is absolutely the perfect smoke and mirrors gimmick <laughs> match. Giant mouse trap, bowling balls, <laughs> fire extinguishers, anything mouse tra- anything you can imagine. They did it. It was so great. And like Michael Cole has never had more fun at his job (laughs) than he was having during this match. I don't know why. I don't know if he was like a big jackass fan (laughs) or if it was like, he was just like completely off the rails. He and he and Pat were just like cracking up the the whole time. And Pat's marking out for all the, the jackass guys and, and, and Michael Cole's just beside himself. He's laughing and, and like just making jokes like it was it was so fun every bit of this presentation was fantastic we, we've seen so much bad michael cole fake laughing over the years that hearing mm-hmm. michael cole actually laugh is refreshing agreed <laughs> yeah yeah uh sasha and naomi won the women's tag titles whatever the next night on raw they beat Liv morgan and rhea ripley in a championship contenders match which normally means if you beat the champs, you get a match. So I thought, oh, great. They're going to, uh, they put just put the titles on them and they're already going to be the champs. No, the champs beat the challengers. And then the challengers were awarded another match for the titles <laughs> the following sure. week. Why not? Well, what else are you going to do? You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, they're setting up, you know, it appears that they're selling up, setting up uh, Rhea Ripley uh, turning on Liv Morgan, obviously. Mm-hmm. And it actually ties into the next match, which uh, Edge beat AJ Styles with help from Damian Priest. And I guess there's the word is that they're giving Edge a little stable here with Edge, Damian Priest, maybe Champa, and maybe Rhea Ripley. And it would make sense if Rhea is going to go heel. For her to be a part of that group, I suppose. I I guess that works in the sense of like Edge can I I I to be fair, I don't think she's had a lot of opportunities to do so, but Rhea maybe isn't a super strong promo, especially if she's trying to be a heel. So you could potentially have Edge be working as a manager in some spaces for her. Also, I assume Edge isn't gonna be on the road or at least not going to be wrestling every right. month. Like last year, he took a pretty long break after Mania. So 
you can have him put this stable together and then, you know, he maybe doesn't have to go to TV every week or if he does, he just has to stand in the corner and then talk for, for whoever. Like, I think that's, that's fine. Um, I mean, this is, uh, this, this will tie into uh, the only thing I'll say about uh, dynamite at this point, uh, which is the Julia Hart stuff, which is that I'm fine. If you want to make her a heel, I guess, or put her with Alistair Black even, Um, but don't, don't spin me spooky lore about it. Just do it. <laughs> that's and fine. that's kind of my stuff with edge and, and this group of he's like, he's just, he's opened up the thesaurus. So he's like, he's taking, he's like a little bit Alistair black. He's a little bit like the Nick Bockwinkle, Chris Jericho heel. Cause he's using big words and wearing a suit. And then he's mixed in like some corporate ministry or something like that in there as well. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure what he's up, what he's up to, or what what this what this is in his mind. But it's um, it is he, one of those things where you'd like to ask him, "Hey, hey, Adam, big big fan, like, yes, what, what what do you th- what does this look like in your head?" And then yes. how close to what we see on screen is what is is that? Yes, I'm not I'm not sure. But we'll see what happens there going forward. Seamus and Ridge along with their pal Butch, who they grew up with in the pubs of Dublin, <laughs> Ireland, beat the New Day in a match that was cut from night one and got one minute and 40 seconds on night two. <laughs> we simply sure. didn't have the time. <laughs> sure, why not? Well, because the next, because Pat McAfee beating Austin Theory had to go 10 minutes, mm-hmm. and then Mr. McMahon wrestling against Pat McAfee and beating Pat McAfee. Austin Theory couldn't beat Pat McAfee, but 76-year-old Vince McMahon could beat Pat McAfee in four minutes. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. It was an angle to set up Steve Austin coming out, and it was good in that sense. Yeah, no, I it, I, I would have maybe just, you know, had Vince get in, get in McAfee's face and have Theory beat him down and then hit Austin's music. I don't think he had to do the the match i i was reminded i forget who said it on twitter they're doing that netflix documentary about vince yes and i wonder if maybe this is the finale of it could be um, or that this will at least play a chapter in it that he, he came out of retirement to have one last wrestlemania moment with steve austin and, good good at a theory as any as and, i've heard yeah and again i don't know why to do that you also had to have a weird four minute match where i thought that Okada versus Tenru was like <laughs> the most immobile I had ever seen a man in a wrestling ring when yeah. Kazuchika Okada had to power bomb himself yes. at uh, like a 2015 retirement show for Tenru. Vince McMahon less mobile than that guy somehow couldn't do anything. Couldn't lift his arm to hit a clothesline. Couldn't, yep. couldn't, couldn't do one single thing. No, could barely, could barely want. And then yes, uh, and it did all lead to the funniest thing of the entire weekend which was him trying to take a stunner which he was he was not good at when he was 50 years old in 1997 or whatever uh right. and it was even worse it was it was the worst stunner of all time which in turn kind of made it the best stunner of all time yeah yep seeing him in a black tank top and blue slacks was hilarious too by the way mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i don't know why but yeah uh roman reigns beat brock lesnar in kind of a dud main event this yeah. didn't do anything for me yeah like i didn't like the crowd didn't turn on it this time <laughs> so there's yeah. that um but yeah it was it was the roman reigns and brock lesnar match it's that match they always have except maybe a shorter version and maybe brock got his bell rung at one point and maybe roman hurt his shoulder or something it's hard to say but yeah. yeah they just they just went like 12 minutes and Roman beat him with a spear. It wasn't uh, particularly eventful. Suplex Superman punch, suplex Superman punch, spear through the barricade, spear, kick out. F5. Uh, F5, kick out. Spear, kick out. F5, kick out. Yeah. 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 I'm back to the point where I don't need to see this match template <laughs> again for a long time. But yeah, so we'll see. We'll see where they go here. And then the next night, Cody Rhodes opened the show on Raw saying he's going to win the WWF title. His daddy never won. Um, very nice. Roman Reigns said he'll let us know what he's doing on SmackDown. <laughs> okay, 
great. <laughs> Sounds great. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Veer showed up. Not a whole lot happened on the Raw after WrestleMania, which, frankly, I'm okay if you want to kill the concept. But, boy, did they kill the concept. Well, it's just, and it's funny because it turned out they had their biggest audience since, like, January of 2021 for this show. So you probably should have shot an angle. Yes. (laughs) But I think their mindset was we're, everybody's burnt out, and it's, we're going up against the NCAA finals. So... We'll have Cody come out in the first hour. We had the very exciting uh, return slash debut of, of Ezekiel. Oh, that's right. The and return. Yes. Don Morocco walked out on Raw this week to, <laughs> to do a segment with Kevin Owens. Yeah. And then, sure. uh, and then we just sort of punted the, for the rest of the, the two hours. Nothing, nothing on the show was bad, but uh, yeah, it, it, it all led to a main event where Roman Reigns did his entrance said his catchphrases and then said, I'm not doing any angles tonight. I'll see you Friday. <laughs> well, all right. And then Cody beat uh, Kevin Owens in a dark match. Mm-hmm. Like I, ad- I understand not wanting to put that match on TV necessarily, but uh, you did screw the, uh, the 2 million people who watched and you rewarded the 12,000 people in the building, which eh, I understand it, but yeah. Better than screwing them both over, I guess. <laughs> I suppose. But yeah. Uh, Dynamite had a real good Young Bucks FTR match and a bunch of stuff setting up a live rampage next week and a Battle of Belts show next week and a tables match with the Hardys and the Butcher and the Blade, which Oof. had the. <laughs> I. I can't begin to understand <laughs> i just can't begin to understand uh what'd you think of dynamite this week yeah i thought the opener i thought it was a a well bookended show mm. and a lot of stuff in the middle that i didn't enjoy um i thought the opener with adam cole and christian was really really good match uh, uh christian can still have really good matches uh mm and edge cannot um and then i thought the promo afterwards with hangman page was fantastic um and set up that that mean event fascinating me that they're doing it on the rampage and not the belt show but i guess i guess those are just kind of punts at this point i guess they've just decided they're not gonna <laughs> try they're not gonna try uh to do why would thing. you tell why would you basically tell people that though yeah it's fascinating it's fascinating they're not not really even attempt but uh yeah and then that led to uh like i said i didn't i didn't really enjoy most of the middle of the show and that i thought that hardy's match was really bad <laughs> and i don't blame their opponents for that because they've had good matches and good hardcore brawls with other people um and then yeah i thought the main event was absolutely fantastic and you know maybe as good if not better than the briscoe's match from from earlier in the week that ftr had so um yeah it was really good i was a little surprised that it was just a clean finish and ftr won um i thought i think in my head this was this it made sense for the bucks to win again here and then you set up a rubber match or you set up the a third match with them you know with ftr finally getting the big win there as baby faces but they gave it to him here instead they did my only knock on that match is they did the foot on the rope, ring the bell, mm. restart the match thing. That's fair. Uh, yeah. So even if you just even if you don't ring the bell, or or if you do that spot, just don't ring the bell, mm-hmm. because the ringing the bell takes the fans out of it. And then you announce, okay, no, his foot was on the rope. We're restarting the match, like Hogan and Randy Orton at SummerSlam 2006. <laughs> like, you don't have to do the phone. You don't have to ring the bell. The ref can just mm-hmm. realize it. Anyway, that's my only knock on that match. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought, yeah, I thought it was it was really really strong. It was it was a total like young bucks match, but it was kind of fascinating to see them do that and still be the heels and for the crowd to really embrace FDR as, as baby faces was, was pretty fascinating. I think FDR are better suited to be baby faces. 
because it's less of them on offense, which is when I get a little bit bored watching their matches a long, a lot of time. I think they, both guys have good fire. They're both good at selling. And, and I think, I think they could be, they could have a good fun run as baby faces and maybe actually live up to what a lot of people uh, were hoping they would be in AEW, uh, which again, for my money, they really had not uh, other than a few matches with Sting and, and uh, CM Punk and then the two matches with the Bucks. So uh, a really good week for FTR. And, you know, uh, jokes aside, I don't, I don't want to take anything away from them. They've worked really hard. And again, I think they, I think they're great and I, as baby faces in, in these, in those two matches. And I'd like to see them go on a run as baby faces. Maybe that would be good for them and would, would help freshen them up going forward. I think the problem though, is the only problem with that is that uh, just naturally very, very unlikable people. <laughs> <laughs> they're a bit cantankerous, you know? Yes. Yes. But we'll see. All right. Oh, and Samoa uh, Joe, uh, Samoa Joe beat the tar out of, of Max, Max Caster. That was fun. Yeah. In the, uh, in the, uh, the Owen Hart tournament. All right. Anything else? No, I think that covers it. It was, I've watched so much professional wrestling in the last, the last seven days. And uh, yeah, most of it, I'm happy to say was somewhere between pretty good to great. So I don't have a, I didn't, I didn't watch a lot of bad wrestling in the last week, which I appreciate. Uh, I thought everything for the most part, WrestleMania, I had really no expectations for. And I thought both, I thought Saturday, especially was a great show. I thought Sunday was good enough. <laughs> and then I thought uh, I thought Dynamite this week, like I said, had some good wrestling on it. And then the ROH show had good wrestling on it. So watched a lot of wrestling, saw a lot of good wrestling. So two thumbs up for the last week. All right. Roll Tide. Until next time, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Adios. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. When I worked for a a home improvement company who was supervising the door-to-door people, there was a kid uh, uh, every day. I would say, what's up, Jave? How are you? And he would say, you know what, man? We out here. And I'd be like, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, we are. And so that's generally one of my my go-to responses. When people ask me how I'm doing, I'm like, you know what? We out here. Makes sense. I like it. We, in fact, out here. Yeah. Not, not going to bury anyone by name because I think sometimes they might listen to the program here, but I'm supposed to have a phone call with someone today at 5 o'clock. They no called, no showed. Hmm. 5.45 or so, get a message saying, oh, I screwed up time zone math. Uh, I need to, uh, Can I, are you free at 6? And I said, yes. Mm-hmm. No call, no show at 6. <laughs> get a message at 6.20. Sorry, I got, I lost track of time. Can you, uh, I, here's, here's my phone number. Can you call me? It's well, I can, but none of this was my idea. <laughs> and I am not the one that needed to talk on the phone. Uh-huh. Just a, ma- a maddening sequence of events here over the last hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's. <laughs> I'm fascinated by somewhere between 545 and six o'clock somehow losing. (laughs) I can understand. I can almost understand. I mean, it's still perhaps a bit inconsiderate, but if it's like if you at noon, he was like, oh, I need to change the time uh, that we talk. Can we talk at six instead? And then he lost track of time. I'd be like, all right, that's there's a lot of time there between when we decided on when you were going to 
talk and sure <laughs> and, uh, when uh, when the call actually was supposed to take place but uh, 15 minutes doesn't seem like enough time for me to uh to lose track of time but that's just me you know yeah 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 you would think uh yeah you would think that this could uh yes i just i've i've had quite enough of today to be honest with you <laughs> fair enough and uh the day's only just begun so there we go <laughs> Get to drive to New York tomorrow. Oh, that's tomorrow, is it? It is. Yeah. Hope, hope she's uh, she's not all brothered out, you know. <laughs> Certainly hope that if you're paying money for a photo opportunity and an autograph, that the person is sober and present in all ways. I think that's fair. I think that's. <laughs> I think that's a fair, uh, fair uh, demand, given yeah. uh, given the price and uh, the drive. Yeah, yeah, but I get a day off work, which is like my first day off work in uh, three years. So that's 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 good. Awesome. What else would one do on a day off? <laughs> you know, when you don't, when you take a day off from wrestling, the thing you got to do is go do a wrestling thing. <laughs> Terrible. Oh, absolutely terrible. I try to keep on keeping on.